Sorry, my friend is bringing me a smoothie. Oh, that's very nice of your friend. <laughs> okay, bye. I'm just like, sorry guys, I gotta eat. What's good? Thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of The Newest Olympian. My name is Mike Schuber. I'm the titular Newest Olympian. I'm a 31-year-old man who never read the Percy Jackson books as a kid, but I'm reading them now for the very first time as an adult because I'm on a quest to determine if this is a book series that we've all been sleeping on, and I'm not on this quest alone. I'm never on this quest alone, and today we are joined by someone who is new to the show. Very excited to have them on the show. It is Willa, a.k.a. Willary Wisp from TikTok. Willa, how's it going? It's good, Mike. I'm having so fun. I'm having so much fun. Not so fun. So much fun. <laughs> so much fun. Yeah, I'm excited to have you here. You had reached out and saw your TikTok content, and I'm very excited to have you on, not only for your Percy Jackson knowledge, but also as people who might know from TikTok, from your content specifically, that you have Tourette's and you make videos about Tourette's. And I've yep. learned from just watching your TikToks already, and I'm excited to learn more about it as we record this episode. And just talk a little bit about how some of that representation in the series can find its way into people's real lives to where they feel seen in the books. So I would love to get your perspective as well. But I guess just for folks off the jump, just to get a basic understanding, how does Tourette's work? Has it affect you? And what would people might not know? Because I feel like there's the conception of what it is versus what it is actually yeah, so Tourette's is, uh, it's short for Tourette's syndrome or TS. It's a neurological disorder that causes involuntary movements and sounds called tics that can include simple tics like whistling or grunting or anything like that, neck movements, stuff like that, or complex tics, which are the more, the longer ones or the ones that involve more muscle groups and stuff like that, so... Yeah, so if you hear me whistling, um, that's why it's a tick. Okay. And just for the listener, this is something that Will and I talked about earlier, is that normally when we put these podcasts out, we edit things out, whether that is me messing up what I'm saying or editing out little background noises and stuff. Some of the ticks probably will be edited out, but I didn't want to put forth an episode where it was like, I need to edit all of them out because this is who you are and I'm not going to try to, you know hide you and be like, oh, no, this isn't it. So, but yeah, there, there will be some that come through. There will be some that's edited out. And that's just how the episode will sound as we go forward. Yeah. As far as your history with the Percy Jackson books, how did you get into them? When did you start reading them? What's your backstory? OK, so when I was in like middle school, I picked one up at the library and I had heard from my cousin that they were good. And so I read them. I read them all very quickly I didn't read the Heroes of Olympus books until quite a bit later, but I had a Percy Jackson themed birthday for my <gasps> 13th birthday party. Oh, amazing. What were the details? Were you dressed up in costume? Were there blue desserts? <laughs> yeah. So we made blue chocolate chip cookies and we made Camp Half-Blood t-shirts. We went to like Dollar Tree and got orange t-shirts and some like printable stick on paper mm -hmm. and we made... You know those like cake pop things that you can make? We made mm -hmm. blue cake pops and cookies and the whole shebang. And we made fake swords out of cardboard. Yes. And I forced all of my friends to have a sword fight in the front lawn. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. As long as no one got hurt, right? Everyone was good. <laughs> oh, no. I, there were lots of fatalities. <laughs> <laughs> it was a I dark was the only day. one standing. <laughs> Oh, that's fantastic. Well, that is very good. I'm excited to talk about the chapter and a half or so that we'll be discussing today. We're going to finish up chapter 17 and then cover all of chapter 18. We're getting into some really spicy territory here in book five. It's quite intense. And I am very intrigued to see how things wrap up because there's only about like 60 pages after we talk about what we're talking about. And... Oh, there still feels like there's a lot to happen, but there's a lot to cover. So I think we just get right into it. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds good to me. Fantastic. So where we last left our heroes, we had Grover and Annabeth leaving the 
Palace of Olympus in a not too awkward, but kind of awkward fashion so that Percy and Rachel Elizabeth Thayer could have a bit of a moment together. And Percy tells Rachel Elizabeth Thayer that he wants to introduce her to someone and then brings her over to Hestia. Hestia greets them both, and Rachel Elizabeth Thayer asks if she's been expecting her after receiving her greeting. Based on the way that Hestia greeted her, she was like, oh, are you expecting me? Hestia then holds out her hands. The coals around the hearth glow, and Percy sees a vision of Sally, Paul, and him eating Thanksgiving dinner. Then he sees a vision of his friends at the Camp Half-Blood campfire, and then he sees Rachel Elizabeth Thayer and him at the Prius from earlier in this book. And he's not sure if Rachel Elizabeth Thayer is seeing the same things. My guess is that she would probably be seeing things more relevant to her, and I was surprised that Percy is thinking like, oh, I wonder if Rachel Elizabeth Thayer is getting visions of my life as well. (laughs) I think that Percy... Love him to death, but I think sometimes he can get very caught up in just thinking about, not himself in like a selfish way, but just like processing the world through the way that he sees it. Yeah. And so sometimes he's like, he just assumes, oh, this is the way other people see the world and doesn't really like consider the fact that other people have different interpretations of life and the way that they see things. Totally, totally. And this is something that I try to fight against as well. And it's something that even happened in a previous book five episode here when I was talking about when Percy has the dream where he sees Rachel Elizabeth Dare's room and he was saying, oh, yeah, I know what her room looked like because I've been there. And I was like, Percy, you've been in Rachel Elizabeth Dare's room and you don't think there's any sort of potential romantic relationship. But then some people reached out and pointed out, hey, it doesn't necessarily have to be romantic. And I was like, oh, right. That was just my particular situation of... I grew up in a house and my parents didn't let me have girls over into my room. And thus, it was more of this taboo relationship type thing, whereas that's not the case for everybody else. So, yeah, I can see how some people would think that. And I can see how people can sometimes forget to, you know, take other people's perspectives. Like, I don't know, what if you grew up in an apartment and your place only has like two rooms? You know, it's completely different. So I can see that. I try to avoid it. But in this particular instance, I would feel like Percy should know that she's probably not seeing Percy Jackson rewind channel out of the heart. Yeah, no, I think it's I think it's very funny that I can't tell if it's part of his ADHD because I have ADHD. And so sometimes I get caught up in seeing the world a certain way because of it. But I also just think it's very funny that he does not have that awareness of saying, oh, other people see this, but I'm seeing this. Instead, he's like, oh, yeah, she's seeing that because I'm seeing that. It makes sense. Yeah, and it doesn't even feel like it's a narcissistic thing where he's like, well, obviously, she's seeing visions about me. I think it's just Percy not necessarily putting two and two together where instead of him going the next step and being like, well, she's probably seeing stuff about her, he's just thinking like, oh, that's weird if she's seeing stuff about me. (laughs) Yeah, I think he's very much that kind of guy. Like, he's not, it's definitely not a narcissistic thing. It's just a thing that he just thought And I think that a big part of the series is just we get snippets into things he just thought. Right. (laughs) And I find that very interesting and very funny. And that's, I think, part of the reason why the book series did so well as a whole is because we get to see things he just thought. That's what I think makes the first person narration choice such a smart one is that basically every second that he is a narrator, anytime he tells us about his emotions or thoughts... He's also a character, so we doubly know Percy. It's not just some omniscient narrator telling us about his life. Now, when Percy sees Rachel Elizabeth Dare see whatever vision she sees, he notices that she calms down. Hestia tells her that she needs to claim her place at the hearth, and in order to do so, she must let go of her distractions because it's the only way that she'll survive. Rachel Elizabeth there says that she understands, and Percy clearly does not understand. He wants to know what Hestia is talking about. Rachel Elizabeth there takes a breath and tells Percy that when she showed up here, initially she thought she was doing this all for him, but now she realizes that that's not the case. And now Percy does get into a little bit of main character syndrome territory. He gets upset, saying, wait, now I'm a distraction? What distraction in italics? Is this because I'm not the hero, in quotation marks, or whatever? And I love that, and it's also exactly how I would phrase something like this. Like, I would certainly do that turn of phrase if I was angry at something like this. I would like to think I wouldn't be, but... But the particular phrasing, I think, is really nice. So yeah. I appreciate that. Yeah, I think, honestly, not to like bring up ADHD again, but... Look, it's super relevant. <laughs> yeah, I think that's part of Percy's impulsivity shining through 
is just his immediate reaction of, oh, because I'm a distraction. Like, instead of thinking it through and being like, okay, let me process this, he just immediately goes with what his gut feeling is. And I think that's really interesting because, again, like, it shows that he's not perfect and that he is very impulsive, which we see throughout the series. And I actually really like that. And I admire Rick Riordan for doing that. Is that something that you saw or you felt like that was true to you growing up and living with ADHD? Yeah. So I actually wasn't diagnosed with ADHD until much later. Okay. I didn't know that I had it. And so I just didn't have a basis for why I was so impulsive because I would get in trouble a lot and I would be reprimanded for saying things out of turn and stuff like that. And I didn't really have any way of knowing why until all of a sudden I got this diagnosis and I was like, oh, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Did you have the diagnosis of ADHD before or after Tourette's syndrome? Before. Okay. Okay. So was Tourette's syndrome something you always dealt with or did it like develop as you got older or was it a similar thing with ADHD where like you had it, but you didn't know exactly what was happening? Yeah, it's kind of a mixture of all of the above. So I had mild tics um, and compulsive movements when I was like five or six. And then I didn't really, my parents didn't think much of them. They just thought they were anxious behaviors Okay. because I've always been a very anxious kid. And then in like middle and high school, I started developing like facial twitches and stuff like that. And I would want to say like bad words and things that I wasn't supposed to say. And I tried to hide it and I didn't know what was going on because I didn't know what Tourette's was. And then I saw a video about this girl who had Tourette's and I was like, oh, okay, cool. Interesting. And then (laughs) (laughs) it stayed mild for a while until college and in college it just absolutely exploded and I went to the doctor I first got told that I couldn't have Tourette's because it didn't affect my life enough what a doctor said that yes yes my psychiatrist said that to me and I was kind of like why would I be here if it didn't affect my life enough oh my gosh I'm so sorry that's awful I know I know but it's okay because I went to a neurologist and he was like yeah you for sure 100% have Tourette's syndrome (laughs) and I was like thank you thank you Uh, well, shout out to doctor number two, doctor number one. Mm-mm, not a fan, yeah. not a fan. Yeah. <laughs> so Percy's a bit upset here, asks this of Rachel Elizabeth there, and she says that she can't really put it into words. She was drawn to Percy because he opened the door to all of this and she needed to understand her true sight. But now she knows that their fates aren't intertwined. And she tells Percy that deep down he knows it, too. Narrator Percy then says, quote, I stared at her. Maybe I wasn't the brightest guy in the world when it comes to girls, which is a thousand percent accurate, Percy Jackson. I feel like you are quite adept at many things, but understanding people who are interested in you, not one of them. But I was pretty sure Rachel had just dumped me, which was lame considering we'd never even been together. And lame aside, this book being written in the late 2000s, I think this quote is very funny, just of Percy basically admitting that he got dumped by someone who wasn't even his girlfriend stinking is uh, pretty fun and very teenage boy of him, but also understandable. Yeah, I've never been a teenage boy, so I can't attest, but um, (laughs) I have been a kid with ADHD, so I can't attest. (laughs) Well, let me bring the teenage boy perspective into the mix, which is, yes, I sometimes would feel upset when I learned that a particular girl that I was interested in was not interested in me, even if the situation made sense or otherwise. There was a time when I was about to move to Texas, and there was a girl I had a crush on, and I let her know that I had a crush on her, and she was like, aren't you moving in like two months and I was like that's besides the point <laughs> like, oh, no. it was very foolish of me to think like oh yeah what do you think is gonna work here dude uh, but as a teenage boy I was still upset but <laughs> now I realize that was foolish Percy who's still upset at this situation says so what quote thanks for bringing me to Olympus see ya is that what you're saying which now he's getting a little a little too sassy uh, I get that he's upset and he's got a lot going on but come on I think Rachel Elizabeth there is handling this quite well. So I don't know that Percy needs to take out his frustration about the situation onto her. Rachel Elizabeth there just stares at the fire. And then Hestia says that Rachel Elizabeth there has expressed all that she can and that her moment is coming. But Percy's decision approaches even sooner. And then she asks him if he is prepared. Narrator Percy reveals to us, the reader, that he's not even close to being prepared which makes sense given that he really hasn't had a whole lot of time to prep. He's been a little busy consistently fighting off monsters and such for the past, you know, 
whole book, so I get it. And then Percy looks at Pandora's jar and is tempted to open it for the first time. He thinks that hope is useless to him right now. A lot of bad stuff going on with him. Rachel's but dares cutting him off. Annabeth is angry with him. His parents, I love that he says his parents. I love that he has brought Paul into being his dad. His parents are asleep and in danger. Olympus is about to fall. And he's seen visions of the gods' awful deeds, such as Zeus, what he did to Maria D'Angelo, Hades, what he did to the Oracle, and Hermes, what he did to Luke. So I can understand Percy having a bit of despair here. Things have been pretty rough. Yeah, I think it's hard to process as a kid. Like, Mm -hmm. that's one thing I think people forget about in this series is that Percy Jackson is a child. Mm -hmm. And he is processing all of this in such a way that is so much, like, even despite... Him being a kid, he's had to grow up so fast. And I think that he is just dealing with this in any way that he can. And obviously, he's processing in so many different ways. Like, obviously, like we can see that he's mad at Rachel Elizabeth Dare. He is frustrated that Annabeth is mad at him. He's kind of like thinking, oh, what is my relationship with Hope and how this is going? Because it's such an insurmountable enemy to face. Mm -hmm, as a kid mm -hmm. and as a demigod because he's so much smaller he just has a lot of reactions and i think they're all valid yeah i think that is something that maybe if this was a third person narrator book instead you could have something where every now and then the narrator would say something like percy who is 16 yeah uh, (laughs) they just keep reminding us that he is much more mature beyond his age because i couldn't handle the stuff that he's handling at 16 are you kidding me no the weight of the world on his shoulders (laughs) yeah at 16 i was dealing with like emotions for the first time i was like There was no way that I could have. Absolutely not. I was like, man, I was a terrible 16 year old. I'm not going to lie to you. Oh, yeah. I was just I was a bad 16 year old. Yeah, it was bad. (laughs) (laughs) I won't get into it, but it was bad. Sure. I would like to think I was okay, but I certainly got mad at things that didn't warrant it and, you know, thought things like the friend zone existed. You know, I, I had my my faults at 16. <laughs> we, were, we were all in not the best spots. Did I have a bowl cut at 16? Or had <gasps> I, Yeah, I had a bowl cut at 16. Like, oh you know. Oh, my God. Yeah, we, we all make our mistakes. We, we all have our past that we're not proud of. Yeah, I may have I may have made some mistakes, but I've never had a bowl cut. So look, look, it was it was the time. It wasn't like strict bowl, but like looking back, like, yeah, it was. But it was just I don't know. That was me from 2005 to like 2009. Oh it, was, it wasn't until senior year that I realized this is a bad situation going on and then got to cut shorter. And it was a lot smarter. Mistakes were made. But they're in the past, and I've grown from them. (laughs) They're in the past. (laughs) They're in the past, and that's where they stay. And that is where they belong. Percy then hears the voice of Prometheus in his head call for him to surrender. But then Percy looks at Hestia and thinks of all the positive images that he saw in the hearth. He also remembers what Chris Rodriguez said, there's no point in defending Camp Half-Blood if everyone dies and everyone, all of his friends, are here. And also what Nico said, which is that if Olympus falls, it doesn't matter to Hades if his palace is safe. His palace won't have any relevance. So Annabeth and Grover then return. And Annabeth can tell that something is up. And with concern in her voice, not anger, she asks if they should leave again. And I really appreciate this growth from Annabeth. In this specific portion of the book, we've already seen her come to grips with Luke truly being awful and realizing that she was wrong for thinking that he wasn't in the wrong. And now we have her being more understanding and more patient with Rachel Elizabeth Dare and specifically Rachel Elizabeth Dare with Percy. A lot of growth from Annabeth in just like a chapter and change. And I think that's fantastic. I'm really happy for her. For sure. For sure. Narrator Percy then says, quote, suddenly I felt like someone injected me with steel. I understood what to do. And I know that this is just a turn of phrase, but how does Percy Jackson know what getting injected with steel feels like? I don't know what that feels like. He has an active <laughs> he, imagination. He does. He does. You know, he's compared the weights of things to the weight of a tank and stuff like that. But I guess it would just be like a chill. I guess what he's trying to say is chill through your body. But I don't know. Injected with steel is quite an intense way to say it. But he has this feeling like he's been injected with steel. (laughs) 
I like the narrator voice that you just took on for that. <laughs> the, the intense action-y voice. Oh, I feel so, I don't, it, for me, it felt like Wolverine. Doesn't he have like adamantium or whatever in his blood? Like it, it, he's got, yes. you know, metal inside of him. <laughs> That's what it reminded me of. I love it. Percy looks at Rachel Elizabeth there and checks to make sure that she's not going to do anything whack, especially after talking to Chiron. And she smiles and asks Percy if he, of all people, is the one who's worried about her doing something reckless. And I think that's great. I like that Rachel Elizabeth there, even in this big situation where she realizes something important and intense is about to happen, she can still poke fun at Percy Jackson, and I think that is really good. It's very important to be able to make fun of him at any moment, because sometimes he is worthy of ridicule, like he is in this instance. <laughs> Percy replies, but I mean, will you be okay? And Rachel Elizabeth there says that she's unsure, but, quote, that kind of depends on whether you save the world, hero. And I I like you poking fun at Percy, but no time for cute nicknames, Rachel Elizabeth there. You just basically dumped him. So you don't get to do your equivalent of seaweed brain here. You got to drop that. <laughs> the love triangle is over. It's now a one-way Percy Annabeth. You're out of the picture. No cute names complicating things anymore because now you're making me sad. <laughs> oh, it's always been a one-way Annabeth Percy thing for me. It was never. Yeah, you you never questioned it at all with Rachel Elizabeth there coming into the mix? No. That's valid. That's valid. I knew that they were going to end up together, so it wasn't necessarily like something that I felt deep down, not with external knowledge, just because I know that they are both in the sequel series, so I figured they're probably together. And this was a wild turn where they didn't end up together, and Annabeth is actually the villain of Heroes of Olympus. That, I guess, could have been something, but I knew they were probably going to end up together. And even when Rachel Elizabeth there was first introduced as like a possibility of a love interest in book four, I was like, nah, not really a thing. But man, the beginning of book five stuff made it pretty compelling to me, so it was tough. But it's looking like my prediction from a few episodes back of I think there's going to be something oracle tangential that removes her from the running of Percy Jackson's love interest. That seems to be where we're headed. But as far as I've read, I don't know exactly what's up yet. So let's continue. Percy then grabs Pandora's jar and gives it to Hestia as an offering. Hestia is confused, reasoning that she is the least of the gods, so she wonders why Percy would want to give it to her. But he says that she is the last Olympian and the most important. And she asks why that would be, and he says, because that's the title of the fifth book, Hestia. N no, he actually says uh, that hope survives best at the hearth, which seems like a turn of phrase. I don't know if that's like a common phrase or something. I know a hearth is just like a fire in the center of a house. And I know there is some sentiment around it being important, but I didn't know if hope survives best at the hearth was some sort of phrase or if it was just Percy briefly being very poetic. I think it was just Percy being poetic. I think he just like took that chance and ran with it to be dramatic. I would too. He was like, this sounds good. This is cool. I'm going to say it. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah. So he instructs Hestia to guard the jar for him, and then he won't ever be tempted to give it up again. Hestia smiles, takes the jar, and then it begins to glow. And then the hearth begins to burn a little bit brighter as well. She says, well done, Percy Jackson. May the gods bless you. And Percy replies, we're about to find out. And he calls for Annabeth and Grover to join him as he approaches Poseidon's throne. He asks for Annabeth and Grover to help him up on the throne. Annabeth thinks that this is absurd, and Percy agrees that it is absurd, but he has to do it. Grover warns that the gods hate it when people sit in their thrones, but Percy says he needs to get Poseidon's attention, so it has to be done. Annabeth does admit that it will certainly get Poseidon's attention, so they boost him up, and instantly he can understand how being in this throne could make someone think only about themselves and wonder why they aren't the most important one in the room. You're high above the ground, literally, you're in high status, and he gets how Poseidon or any of the other gods could think, wait a second, what about me? I'm the strongest, blah, blah, blah. So good for Percy to have that understanding, and thankfully he is able to snap himself out of it before he goes, yeah, everyone should be listening to Poseidon, and then not keeping forth with what his mission is. Yeah, for sure. The throne then rumbles, and as narrator Percy, he describes this as, quote, a wave of gale force anger slams into Percy's mind, beginning with, who dares? And then it stops and turns into a more reserved but still perturbed voice, saying, Percy, what exactly are you doing on my throne? 
So Percy apologizes to Poseidon and explains that this was the only way to get his attention. Poseidon says that this was a dangerous move because if he hadn't looked before he blasted, he may have turned Percy into a puddle. And I'm glad that Poseidon would have the patience to at least look at the person he's about to vaporize into a puddle of seawater instead of just no look blasting. Oh, man. Yeah. Talk about not having any sort of patience. He's like, you're welcome. We're all like, why would you have to say you're welcome for that? (laughs) Right. You are infinite years old. You can't wait two seconds to make sure that your own son isn't the person who's sitting on your throne. No. Why would he ever have to do that? Why would he ever have to do that? That's right. Yeah. That's foolish of me for even considering that Poseidon would have to spend any amount of time looking before blasting. Percy apologizes and relays that things on the surface aren't going super well. Narrative Percy says, quote, I told him what was happening, then I told him my plan. But then he doesn't say the plan. And at first I was quite upset because I don't like when Percy doesn't tell us stuff. I want to be clued in. But thankfully, the reveal of the plan happens about one sentence later. So my anger was quickly washed away because Poseidon has a long pause. But then he says to Percy that what he is asking for is impossible because he must defend his palace. And then right away I'm realizing, oh, okay, Percy has asked him, come here and join the fight, leave the palace behind. Became pretty obvious, so no longer mad at my good friend Percy Jackson, who normally tells me everything when he's the narrator. Percy, who calls him dad, which I always love, love when he calls him dad, loves when Paul is considered a parent, good stuff. Percy calls him dad and explains that Kronos sent an army against him, Poseidon, intentionally because he knows Poseidon teaming up with the gods would tip the scales. And this is basically the Chris Rodriguez thought that Percy had earlier inspiring his idea. Poseidon says that regardless of if this is true, that he would tip the scales, his home is being attacked and he must defend it. Percy reminds him that Olympus is his home. And then Percy feels a rush of anger from Poseidon that eventually subsides. Percy then asks if Tyson is okay, which does surprise Poseidon and surprised me. Surprised in. (laughs) But Poseidon says that Tyson is doing better than he anticipated, though he does think peanut butter is a strange battle cry. I love that that comedic moment came back. The champion cry of peanut butter was fantastic, especially as me, a big peanut butter fan. So the fact that that is becoming a recurring bit, I love it. I love it. There should be some Percy Jackson branded peanut butter when the show comes out. Like maybe when they do season five or something, they do a little like Tyson's peanut butter. Come on, Disney, hit me up. Let's make the marketing happen. <laughs> the logo is just one eye. <gasps> oh, yeah. It, <laughs> oh, it could it could be like a peanut, but then turned into an eye because they're kind of like the same shit. We, we've nailed it here. Yeah, we would. <laughs> they should hire us. <laughs> Both of us at once. Of course. Now, very important question. Are you a smooth peanut butter person or a chunky peanut butter person or a not peanut butter person at all? Okay. Smooth peanut butter on sandwiches. Chunky peanut butter with apples. Ooh, I like that. Okay. I'm chunky all the way, but I appreciate that you have enough of the peanut butter thought process to have different things for different occasions. That's good. That's good. I like that. Percy is shocked that Poseidon let Tyson fight. But Poseidon then chides Percy for changing the subject and asks Percy if he understands that what he is asking Poseidon to do will result in his palace being destroyed. Percy's counter is that going through this can save Olympus, and that's more important. And then Poseidon says, which is very funny, Do you have any idea how long I've worked on remodeling this palace? The game room alone took 600 years, which, ah. I love it. I love when he just becomes like a dad. It's great. Being upset about home renovation projects, phenomenal, phenomenal. Percy just replies, dad, which is the correct response here. And Poseidon grumpily agrees, saying, but my son, pray this works. And Percy reminds him that he is praying since he's talking to him. Poseidon says, oh, yes, good point. Amphitrite incoming, which I guess is some sort of attack from one of the enemies, and the connection is then lost because there's some sort of big boom. Percy then comes down from the throne. Grover is worried and asks Percy if he's okay since he started smoking. Percy doesn't think that that's true, but then he looks at his arms and realizes that he is. And then Annabeth says that if he had stayed up there much longer, he would have spontaneously combusted. She says she hopes the conversation was worth it. Bessie moves. Glad Bessie is still here. Love Bessie reminding us that they are still in the room. Very happy that he's there. Percy says that they will find out soon enough if the conversation was worth it. And then the doors open. Thalia rushes in. 
Her bow is snapped and her quiver is empty. And she says, you've got to get down there. The enemy is advancing and Kronos is leading them. And that's the end of chapter 17. Oh, what a spicy note to end on there. Mm hmm. For sure. We will now take a quick break for our mid-roll break, the Cash to Olympian, where we talk about fun stuff going on with the show, live shows, or things on the Patreon, or whatever have you new merchandise. And then we'll be back to talk chapter 18. Hello and welcome to the Cashed Olympian New York City edition. I'm actually recording this before the Percy Jackson New York Comic Con event, which I will be attending as a member of the press. You know me, noted press member Mike Schubert needs to report about the Percy Jackson's going on. Anyway, let's talk about the podcast and stuff that's going on there. A whole bunch of fun stuff has happened recently. We've got merch that is up. You can get camp regular person shirts. They are in the classic orange style and it is a horse not a Pegasus, and it says Camp Regular Person, and then it says Regular Long Island, Regular New York. This is what we have decided on the show is canonically what the Camp half Blood shirts look like in the mist. So you can get that shirt. You can also get the Pro Pigeon Podcast pins on our website, and you can also get some new stickers that we had previously only been selling on tour, but they are now available on the merch store. So all of those things and more are available at thenewsolympian.com slash merch. There's also digital items that have no shipping charges if you live abroad and shipping is cost prohibited. You can get past live shows and digital things like ringtones and wallpapers, all sorts of fun stuff at thenewsolympian.com slash merch. Now, speaking of live shows. We do have two live shows coming this weekend. If you were listening to this the week that it came out, we've got the Doylestown, aka Philadelphia, Pennsylvania show on Saturday, October 21st and the New York City show on Sunday, October 22nd. Both of those are going to be about the first movie, the bad one, and we will be joined by Adam Amawala for both of them. He has never read the books but only seen the movie, so he is our control case. And then in Philly, we'll have Stephen Parra, and then in New York, we'll have Sequoia Simone representing the people who have read the book too. So we will be going through and deciding, is this movie actually bad or are we just grumbly because it's not like the books? Also, Adam is a professional stand-up comedian. He will be opening both of the shows with a 10-minute stand-up set. Going to be hilarious. Going to be some really good stuff. You can get tickets right now at thenewsolympian.com slash live. And then also just a reminder, we have shows in Texas in December. We're coming to Dallas, Austin, San Antonio, and Houston in the middle of December. You can get tickets to those as well at thenewsolympian.com slash live. I want to thank all the folks who came to the library event that I did last weekend. I gave a talk about what it is like to be an adult reading children's books and young adult books and why I think it is still worthwhile for people of all ages to read books targeted towards younger audiences. I'm going to put the audio from that on the Patreon and make that available for folks who are at the bonus episode tier and above. So if you want to hear that, you can go to thenewsolympian.com slash Patreon. And speaking of that Patreon, let's thank the folks who have joined the Patreon most recently. So again, we're doing the just 50 or so names cap, but making our way through the wonderful, beautiful backlog that we have. So shout out to our newest Super God tier patron, Redacted for Spoilers. Shout out to our newest God tier patrons, Clyde Bomstead, Elisa, Alec Lewis, Resso, Quabernut, Emily Patterson, and Hello Lotta in in Finland from your pen pal Isenia in North Carolina. Amazing. I love that so much. And shout out to our newest demigod tier patrons, Ariana, Kristen, Jesse Hu, Sylvan Carey, Christian Siros, Jean Miranda, Zot Zot Zot, Julia Messer, Madeline Smith, Nicole Dean, Chelsea Offerines, Braylon, Reika Verez, Nor Emily, Vonshika Tripathi, Persassi Jackson, Mitali Shinoi, Loris Alovic, or Loris Alovic, Savion Powers, Tegan Merib, Emily Hoos, Jesse Koenig, or Jesse Koenig, if you pronounce it like Sarah Koenig, Musicera, Samantha, Marielle, Alexis Moffat, Icornchen, Dia, Katharina Eifler, Jen Jun, Paul Medley, Emma Maxson, Therese, Cody Dever, Lindsay Fulmer, Charlie Pearl, They Them, Ambra V, Anais Ganon, Denise Robles Casanova, Strike Silver, Sydney Nicole, Soggy Wheatbix, Victoria Andrea Herder, Kaylee, Heather Von Gron, Natalie, Sev182, Rainbow Organic, Nicolette Malloy, Jenny June, Sir Phineas Kirst, and Alexandra Bull. Also, a name correction for I know. Thank you all so much for your support. May Aphrodite bless you that if you have to wake up really early for something, that you don't have big bags under your eyes, making everyone go, oh my gosh, you look so tired, which is always the worst thing to hear when you're tired. 
Now, if you're all caught up on the new Olympian and you're looking for a new podcast to listen to, you are in luck because one of the shows that I make as an independent podcast boy is back for the final portion of season four. That is right. Meddling Adults is back starting this Wednesday, October 18th. We have five brand new episodes that will begin releasing weekly on Wednesdays starting this Wednesday. And Meddling Adults is a game show podcast for charity where I host and guests compete to solve children's mysteries from classics like Encyclopedia Brown, Scooby-Doo, and more. And the winner earns money for a charity of their choosing. It is super fun. It is super goofy. Our first episode is a battle between Ross Bryant and Amir Blumenfeld. Very excited to have the two of them on the show. It's a hilarious Encyclopedia Brown-based episode. You can listen to that episode and all the other episodes that we have posted so far at meddlingadults.com or by searching for Meddling Adults in whatever podcasting app you prefer. Now, before we wrap up here, you're going to hear words from a few sponsors who make it feasible for me to be a full-time podcaster. Some of those ads will be read by me. Others of them won't. The ones that are not read by me are inserted locally. So if you live in Serbia, don't be surprised if you hear an ad in Serbian. Once those ads are complete, we'll get back to this episode of The New Olympian. This episode of The New Olympian is brought to you by Tab for a Cause. Now, in these chapters, we've got Rachel Elizabeth there trying to do her best to contribute good things to the world. And if you want to contribute good things to the world, but in a far more safe manner than what Rachel is considering doing, you could use Tab for a Cause. Tab for a Cause is a browser extension that you install in your browser, and you do so by going to tabforacause.org slash TNO, and then you install it in just a couple of clicks. Every time you open a tab, you get a very pretty nature or architectural background. I just got one of a gorgeous waterfall surrounded by moss and trees, and it gives me the time and the date, and you can add other widgets, and then you will be able to raise money for charity. You might see some ads in the corner, but those ads are how Tab for a Cause raises money for charity. You get a heart for every time you open a tab. You can decide where those hearts go, and that tells Tab for a Cause what charities to support. So right now, I am going to give 199 hearts to the Human Rights Watch, which is an independent international organization that defends the rights of people worldwide. Feels like a good time to do that. And that's how simple it was. So if you want to raise money for charity in the simplest way possible, go to T-A-B-F-O-R-A-C-A-U-S-E dot org slash T-N-O and you can get started today. And you don't have to take a big old risk like Rachel Elizabeth there is doing, potentially becoming the next Oracle. Let's continue on, though, with chapter 18. No, f*** you. Sorry. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Sorry. <God. laughs> that's, uh, oh, that's so good. And we are back, and we are here to discuss chapter 18, which is called My Parents Go Commando. Now, I always try to guess what happens in these chapters. I'm guessing that certainly they have to do something with the war. This is a fun little cheeky turn of phrase for Rick to use with going commando. I'm guessing that they would get a hold of some sort of weapon and then join the fray. The only other thing, if we want to go the other going commando, if Paul Blofus literally poops himself and then has to ditch his underwear. But I feel like it's going to be the literal going commando, not the... Uh, euphemism going commando. Yeah, true. So when our team finally arrives on the ground, it appears to be too late. They see wounded campers and hunters. Clarice is frozen in a block of ice. Centaurs are nowhere in sight. And the Titan army is surrounding the Empire State Building just about 20 feet from the doors. The front portion of the army features Kronos, Ethan Nakamura, the Dracaena Queen. I didn't even know there was a Dracaena Queen. I don't know if I missed that, but now we have Dracana like a specific queen. Dracaena Queen. She's got green armor <laughs> and everything. Let's go. As she should. As she should. And what's funny is I was like, ooh, a new person that we have to worry about. And then like two paragraphs later, uh, we'll see that she is not long for this world. <laughs> <laughs> She did what she needed to do. She served, and that was what's important. Look, she went out in style. She went out looking good. <laughs> and then also in this little group are two of the Hyperborean giant ice giants. Notably absent from this group, though, is Prometheus. Percy thinks that Prometheus might be hiding, which I think means Prometheus is not hiding. I don't know if he's up to something evil or because we know that he might flip-flop sides. I don't know if he is removing himself from the chrono side of things just in case things go poorly because maybe he anticipates things not going well. We saw the last conversation with them, him trying to tell Kronos maybe to wait a little bit to recharge, but Kronos is like, no, 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 I want to fight right now. So there could be one of two things happening with Prometheus, but I at least think it's quite notable that he's not here. And because Percy thinks he's hiding, I feel like not hiding. But 
that would be spoiler town. So let's just rush past that and continue with chapter 18. Keep your trapdoor intact. I will. Kronos is in front of the army here and squaring up with him is Chiron. And I'm worried about Chiron. I really don't want Chiron to die, Ron. And he has an arrow notched and pointed at Kronos's face. But once Kronos sees Percy, he tells Chiron to step aside. Chiron refuses in a tone that is extremely calm, which Percy knows means that he's furious. And I love that. I love that Chiron does that and Percy picks up on that. Just of, if I sound steely cold, it means I'm actually incredibly upset with you. It's good. It's big, uh, I'm not mad, I'm just disappointed vibes. And I really love that for Chiron. Teacher Chiron is coming out again. Yeah, that's definitely a big teacher thing. I feel like it definitely works better for me as a student when a teacher was felt like I had let them down as opposed to yelling at me. Mm -hmm. Not that many of my teachers yelled at me, fortunately. But yeah, I get very squirmy if someone gives me the cold shoulder or something like that. I just feel very like, no, I want to make it up to you. I'm so sorry. Eh." (laughs) (laughs) It's like, please, I'll do anything. Give me another chance. I didn't mean it. (laughs) Percy tries to move, but he is stuck. Same thing goes for Annabeth Grover and Thalia. Annabeth warns Chiron to look out, and then the Dracaena Queen charges him. He fires an arrow right between her eyes, and she poofs instantly. So she was in and out of our lives in a paragraph or so, and gone she is, her armor falling to the ground. Chiron is now out of arrows, so he draws his sword. And this worries Percy because he knows Chiron doesn't like to fight with a sword. Cronus tells Chiron that he's a teacher, not a hero. And Chiron says that Luke was a hero and a good one at that until Cronus corrupted him. But then Cronus bellows, fool, followed by, you filled his head with empty promises. You said the gods cared about me. And Chiron picks up on the me because clearly that is a little bit of Luke fighting through. Where do you stand on liking Luke, hating Luke? Obviously, I'm not a big Luke fan. Are you more sympathetic to him? Uh, Okay, so... I hate him, but Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) I think that it's important to realize that every character has flaws, but every character also has motives. And so it's important to never like discount that. But also some people are just bad. And I think that like I get having daddy issues. I do. But having daddy issues is not enough to wreck the world. And I just don't have any sympathy for him. I really, really don't. And I think that he made a mistake and that is on him. Yeah, I I agree that what he has had happened to him is not necessarily worth the response. I feel like I've got a little bit of sympathy for some of the things he went through, but I don't think what he went through equals let me destroy the entire world. Oh, yeah. So Gronus looks confused, and then Chiron takes his chance and attacks with a feint, followed by a strike to the face. And even though Narrative Percy describes this as being a perfectly executed move, Cronus is able to defend himself, and he knocks Chiron's blade aside and sends him flying backward with an explosion of white light that send away move that we've seen before. And Chiron goes flying and crashes into a building and a wall crumbles on top of him. Annabeth screams no. I was very upset. And when she screams no, the freezing spell breaks. They all run towards Chiron, but they cannot see him even as they are trying to tear through the rubble. Annabeth turns to Luke and says, you in all caps, to think that I, that I thought, and then she draws her knife Percy tries to stop her, but she pushes through. She attacks Kronos, and his smug smirk drops. She gets him between the armor, right at his collarbone, but the knife just bounces off of his skin, and then Annabeth curls over in pain. So clearly his invincibility is still intact. Darn. Yeah, I know. Darn indeed. (laughs) (laughs) Percy grabs her. Yeah, how great would it be if it just ended that way? Uh, Annabeth got him, and that was it. The end. Everyone had a good time. (laughs) Bye, Luke. You're done. (laughs) Bye. Percy grabs Annabeth and pulls her away from a scythe swipe from Kronos. She screams, I hate you, hate in all caps, with tears in her eyes. Percy's a bit unsure who the you is. Percy, I think you're okay. I'm pretty sure she's talking to Luke here. I don't think she's (laughs) mad at you for pulling her away from this dangerous situation. Yeah. Percy tells her that he has to fight him. She says that it's her fight too. Kronos chuckles and says that he can see why Luke wanted to spare her. But sadly, that is not an option. 
Cronus readies his scythe, and Percy prepares to defend, but then a piercing aru echoes behind Kronos. And I was thinking, okay, is this going to be Nico riding in with some Hades reinforcements, such as hellhounds, at least Mrs. O'Leary, the one good hellhound that we know? And it is, in fact, Nico D'Angelo riding atop Mrs. O'Leary. He has a skull-shaped helmet, which one, of course, Nico would, but two, that is rad as hell. And incredibly on vibe for Nico. A skull-shaped helmet? I love it. Oh, the fashion choices. I do love the fashion choices. I think it's very funny that it's so dramatic. It's like father-like son. Oh, yeah. Definitely where he gets it from. And I got to give a shout out to one of our patrons, Buggy Pumpkin in the Discord, fully dressed up in Nico cosplay for the Hartford show that I did recently. And they went all out because they got a happy meal and brought a happy meal to the show. Little red box and everything. Oh, mwah, absolute chef's kiss of a performance there. The dedication. That's amazing. Unmatched. That is incredible. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, Nico, the commitment, we love to see it. He's got his skull-shaped helmet. He's looking fantastic. And he comes in asking if it's too late to become a part of the team. Kronos has a great line, says, quote, son of Hades, and then spits on the ground. Do you love death so much you wish to experience it? Oh, I mean, look, we want to hate Kronos. He's bad and evil. However, that's a good, this is a good line. line. This is a really good line. <laughs> it's a good one. <laughs> but Nico hits him with a pretty good reply, saying that Kronos' death would be great for him. So I like kind of taking it, putting it back into his face. Kronos reminds Nico that he is immortal and tells Nico that he has no business being here. Nico then wields his sword and says, I don't agree, which I love. I love in certain circumstances when things are very heated, just to give a simple, I disagree. I like saying this when I'm playing softball or any other sport in a league where there's a referee and he makes a call that I don't like rather than me get all angry and say like F you blah 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 yeah. sometimes I will just let out a mm, I disagree <laughs> which I think is <laughs> it's so sassy <laughs> it's good because it's just like that is not the context in which you should say I disagree so for Nico to say this in the middle of war mm, top notch top yeah. notch yep now, the ground begins to shake and cracks appear, and I was very excited because I was hoping that Hades would come to his senses and help out, and it seems like that's what's happening, and that is what's happening. We are confirmed because thousands of skeletons begin to emerge from the ground and from these cracks. Kronos then barks at his minions to hold their ground, saying that the dead are no match for them, and I don't know. I mean, they are the undead. It does feel like a thousand plus skeleton warriors with guns and stuff could be pretty formidable against the army. I feel like Kronos should be a little more scared. I would be scared if I was Kronos. I think Kronos has just like this streak of pride that doesn't allow him to be scared by this. Yeah, that makes sense. Hubris is on full display here. He shouldn't even be fighting right now. He was supposed to rest more, wanted to fight right away. So yeah, it does track that he wouldn't be afraid. You're right, you're right. The sky then darkens, which I'm sure is because of the evil afoot, but it also just really helps with the vibes. And then a war horn blares, and a chariot pulled by shadow horses emerges. And inside this chariot is Hades, with Demeter and Persephone riding behind. And this isn't exactly what I was looking for in terms of the Hades redemption arc, but I do like that he is at least come to his senses and is joining the fight and not being super bitter. I would have loved if he didn't have his little grumpy streak earlier in the book where he put Percy in jail for no good reason and was being a big grump. But I'm glad that Nico was able to talk him into it. I think it's really cool that Nico has accomplished a lot and winning over Hades to get him to join the fight is no small task. So shout out to Nico D'Angelo. Yeah, for real. Hades is wearing black armor. He has a blood red cloak and he is wearing his helm of darkness, which narrator Percy describes as changing shape into all these different spooky things. But the really terrifying element of it is that when Percy looks into it, his mind is filled with his worst nightmares. So he imagines that Cronus's army is probably thinking the same thing and they haven't fleed yet. So he thinks that they must be that much more scared of what Cronus would do to them if they left the fight. So kind of really lets us know how powerful and terrifying of a leader Cronus could be. Hades then gives a cold smile and says, hello, father, you're looking dot, 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 young, which is fantastic. Oh my gosh, what a good little opening insult. Mm. I love it. I honestly, you know what? <laughs> I love Hades. Yeah, I did like him in book one. I thought he was wonderfully sassy. He is. And I think that he is just the perfect, like, example of, like, that. 
I don't know what I'm trying to say, but I I mean, he's the right type of like complicated. I don't know if he's necessarily an antihero, but he's the person that pushes against the gods and he's a good foil to the rest of them. Yeah, I think he's fun to have around. I'm really intrigued. I really don't know how things will work in the sequel series. I have no clue exactly what the dynamic is. I don't know if the Greek gods are going to stick around, but. I would be interested to see what a world is like where Hades is now on the side of Olympus and isn't putting all of his effort into hating all of his family members. I think it would be interesting to have him along for the ride, but like begrudgingly getting upset with them at times and stuff as more of like a fun grumpy Hades as opposed to, oh, I'm going to let them lose the war grumpy Hades. So I'll have to see if that manifests. But yeah, I I agree. (laughs) I like Hades' presence. That'd be so interesting, (laughs) wouldn't it? We'll just have to see. (laughs) Now, Kronos says that he hopes that they are here to pledge allegiance. And Hades says no, because Nico convinced him to better prioritize his enemies, which I think is great. He says that as much as he hates, quote, upstart demigods, referring to Percy, he cannot have Olympus fall because then he wouldn't be able to bicker with his siblings, which he loves to do. And despite all this bickering, they can all agree on one thing, and that is that Kronos was a terrible father to all of them. And I like this. This is a great response approach from Hades. This is making me, as someone that was rooting for him, very happy. Demeter agrees with Hades because Cronus had no appreciation for agriculture. I love that she is sticking to her one note. And Persephone gets upset with this again, saying, Mother! And then Hades draws his sword, which is good, because if you've read the Demigod Files, you would know that the sword of Hades is a big thing. And this book keeps flip-flopping back and forth as to whether or not the Demigod Files happened. So I guess now we're on the page of, yes, they did happen, because he has a sword, and he didn't have a sword before the sword of Hades, the third story of the Demigod Files. Chrono says that he doesn't have time for this, and when he said time for this, I was like, time? Is he going to slow time down? But he does something different. He slams the ground with his scythe, and then a crack circles the entire Empire State Building, and a wall of force separates Kronos' vanguard, Percy, and his friends from the rest of Kronos' army and Hades' army and everybody else. Percy asks what's happening. Thalia says that they are being sealed inside. And what he's doing is he's taking the magic borders that were surrounding all of Manhattan and bringing them in so it's just encompassing the Empire State Building and this smaller group of people. And now I figured, okay, the chapter title was his parents go commando. That would mean that they would have to wake up. This is how they're going to wake up because now the magical stuff is just over this smaller group. And as I thought, Narrative person describes cars spring to life, pedestrians wake up and they look at the monsters in confusion and Percy wonders what they see through the mist. And I always wonder this too. This is, I think, going to be one of the more fascinating things about the TV show is if they do a visual representation of what the humans are seeing through the mist. I think that'll be so fascinating because like what what could they even be seeing at this point where Manhattan is being overtaken by monsters? Like what does it even look like? That's so interesting. I never even thought about that as like a possibility, but you're right. Like it'd be so cool to see what the mortals are seeing through the mist. Yeah, I'm not sure. Or at the very least, you know, you could show something where we get to see a bit more of them reacting to the stuff, but it's at least an opportunity, which has me excited and I also, if I ever get to talk to Uncle Rick, I feel like it would be very high on the list of, okay, when Campe was going on and the tourists were freaking out, what were they seeing? When it was the end of book five and the borders got moved in, what would they see? And maybe he doesn't have an answer and that can be some of the fun, but I also think it'd be fun to see like what it would see. Maybe everybody sees something different. It could be depending on the particular mortal. I think there's a lot of possibilities. Yeah, for sure. Percy then sees Paul and Sally emerge from Paul's Prius, and he is terrified because he knows that Sally can see through the mist, so she's going to know exactly what's going on. And Percy can read on her face that she does grasp how dire the situation is currently. Percy hopes that she'll want to run away, but instead she says something to Paul and then they run towards Percy, which has him even more worried. But he knows that he can't call out, though, because then Cronus would know to put her in danger and use that against Percy. And I think that is incredibly smart. Mm-hmm. That is such a smart move from Percy Jackson. I feel like very often you have heroes in superhero movies or whatever make it painfully obvious who their love interest is or their family member or whatever, and then it becomes crystal clear for 
or the villain to snatch them away. So for Percy to have the wherewithal to not let that be known, to keep that poker face, that's a really solid move from Percy. Yeah, for sure. I think it's interesting because he's so impulsive so much of the time. And this was an instance where he held himself back, um, which I think is a really good way to show again how mature that this kid is. Yeah, I think it could be one of those things where the ADHD in battle situations Mm -hmm. gives him those heightened senses. So maybe it was him having the wherewithal of understanding, okay, I got to worry about Cronus who's right in front of me. Okay, my mom and Paul are over there. Oh, right. I got to make sure that I don't make it clear that this guy can see Mm -hmm. them. So it could be reminiscent of when he was fighting Ares one on one in book one and he could sense everything that was going on. So maybe it really just kind of like kicked into those battle instincts. Yeah, for sure. Thankfully, Hades causes a distraction by charging at the wall of force, but it knocks him off his chariot, it blocks him from entering, he even tries to blast it away and that doesn't work, so he changes his approach and instead commands his army to attack the monsters outside the barrier. And Fifth Avenue just descends into utter chaos. The mortals start fleeing, Demeter turns some giants into a field of wheat, Persephone turns Dracani spears into sunflowers, Nico slashes away while defending pedestrians, and Percy's parents continue to run closer and closer to him. Cronus then orders Ethan Nakamura to attend him and sends the giants out to attack Percy and his team. Cronus then enters the lobby, and Percy is angry, and this is great getting back to what we talked about earlier in this episode. He's angry because Cronus has now deemed Percy not worthy of a fight, and he takes that personally. (laughs) I would too. I would also take that personally. (laughs) He got dumped by Rachel Elizabeth Dare in this chapter. Now he's getting dumped by Luke slash Cronus. Oh, man, just uh, just a tough run for my guy, Percy. <laughs> just blow after blow after blow. Yeah, you can't even have the common decency to fight me first. Come on, I'm right here. The Giants attack. Percy takes one down very quickly. Grover saves Annabeth, who can hardly stand from getting frozen by a second giant. But Thalia runs up this giant's back and slices its head off. Narrator Percy describes this as Thalia creating the world's largest headless ice sculpture, which is just a stellar turn of phrase. What a fun little way for Rick to write that. Nico fights his way towards Percy's parents, but they don't wait for help and they continue forward. Paul grabs a sword from a downed hero and stabs a Dracaena, and Percy is absolutely floored, just asking, Paul? And then Paul replies, I hope that was a monster I just killed. I was a Shakespearean actor in college, picked up a little swords play. Glorious. This is phenomenal. This is so funny. (laughs) Yeah, it is. And I think... Percy's kind of seeing, not for the first time, but seeing just how cool his new stepdad is. Yeah, he's a really cool dude. I like that Percy has very much accepted him. And I really want to know, we talked about Mortals Through the Mist. What did Paul think that he was stabbing, that he felt confident enough that it wasn't a person? Clearly, it's not just going to be a person. It had to be something weird. But I don't know. Did he see some sort of large, ferocious animal? Did he see some sort of weather anomaly. Like, was it a tiny little tornado? I have no idea what it is. But for Paul to just stab at something that isn't a monster and be like, well, I hope this is a monster. Compelling. Really good stuff. True. Now, there is a Lestragonian giant that rushes at Sally, and Sally is in the middle of rummaging through an abandoned police car. And I just wrote my notes in all caps. Is Sally going to grab a gun? And uh, looks like that's going to be it. Percy calls out to her, and then she turns around and fires a shotgun at this giant. The giant goes flying. Paul says, nice one. Percy asks when she learned to fire a shotgun. Sally then blows the hair out of her face and says, about two seconds ago, Percy will be fine. Go! And Sally Jackson becoming an action hero? The blowing the hair out of the face first? The line is cool enough as it is. But to blow the hair out first, give the about two seconds ago? Oh my goodness. It's so good. It's so good. Yeah. (sighs) Nico agrees, saying that they will fend off the army. Annabeth yells, come on, seaweed brain, which made me really happy. I just wrote, oh, we are so back. We are at the point where Annabeth doesn't have any weird lingering feelings towards Luke. She is in favor of Percy. She's not mad at Rachel Elizabeth there. She's calling him the cute nickname. Feeling good. I'm feeling good about the trajectory of them eventually getting together. I was worried about how it would all materialize, but it feels like we're on the right track. As a big Annabeth lover from the beginning, were you 
happy at this point? Were you worried that there was any chance that things weren't working out between them? Or were you supremely confident that everything was going to be fine? I think from the moment she first called him Seaweed Brain, I was confident it would be fine. Yeah. I mean, just their dynamic through the whole series was so perfect for the relationship that they were building. And at that point, like, I never had any doubt that it would happen. But at that point, when she called him Seaweed Brain, it's like, okay, there's no doubt in my mind, like, this is going to work out. Like, 100%. They are perfect for each other. Like, every time she calls him Seaweed Brain, it just cements more how good they are for each other. Mm -hmm. It's like when, at least this was the thing that I went through in high school, when uh, telling your significant other I love you was, like, more about, like, making sure things are okay. Like, I had a girlfriend in high school who, like, when we would text, if we would say, you know, like, I love you to say goodnight or whatever, if she just texted back, like, love you without I love you or, like, I-L-Y, that was, like, the key that something was wrong. Like, you know, she wouldn't, like, say... <laughs> the full thing and that's how I knew she was mad at me or that something else was going on and I feel like that being approached to the seaweed brain I would have to reread the books but I don't think she ever calls him seaweed brain when she's upset with him yeah. I feel like it's usually when things are on the higher she gives him the nickname and when things are on the lower she doesn't I would have to double check on that but I would agree with your assessment here. If we're getting a seaweed brain at the end of chapter 18, feeling pretty confident about that momentum riding through the end of the book. Mm -hmm. So she says, come on, seaweed brain. Percy heads towards her, but then he sees the pile of rubble that Chiron should be under, and he feels atrocious for forgetting about him. So Percy tells Mrs. O'Leary to get him out of there, because if anyone can do it, she can. And then Percy Annabeth, Thalia, and Grover run for the elevators. I need some reason for Tyson to get into the mix so that we can get all of our friends in the same room at once. I don't know that we've had that ever. I, again, would have to reread to see if we ever have Annabeth, Thalia, Grover, Tyson, and Percy all together. But if we get our five folks that have been some combination of the main characters, basically, over the course of the five books in the series, that would make me really happy. I know that Percy is called on Poseidon, so maybe Poseidon will bring Tyson along. But if he can join join these other four and they're all together at Olympus trying to save the world, that would make me as a Percy Jackson fan very, very happy. Obviously, you cannot tell me because that would be a spoiler, but this is just something I'm trying to speak into existence. Just speak it into existence, Mike. Manifest it right now. <laughs> <laughs> yes, please. Well, that is the end of chapter 18, and that is the end of this episode of The Newest Olympian. Willa, thank you so much for joining. This was so fantastic. I really appreciate you lending the fandom and your personal experiences into the mix. If people want to find you doing stuff online, where can they find you? Yeah, I am at Willery Wisp on TikTok. That is W-I-L-L-O-R-I-E-W-I-S-P. And I do mostly Tourette's awareness content. Um, I do that with some of my friends and in class and just explaining lots of different things about Tourette's and what it's like to live with it. So uh, yeah, that's where you can find me. And then I'm also on Instagram, uh, the same username. Awesome. Well, thank you again so much for joining. Listeners, thank you for listening. And until we find out what awaits our heroes at the top of the elevator, if they can even go up the elevator, they haven't gotten in yet. So I don't know if they're going to have to take a whole bunch of stairs, but whatever happens to them when they get to Olympus. Until then, we'll proceed you later. Hey there! Thank you so much for listening to this episode of The New Olympian. This podcast is created, hosted, and produced by me, Mike Schubert. I also run the social media and the website. Our editor is Sherry Guo. The music is by Bettina Campamadas and Brandon Google, and the art is by Jessica E. Boyd. If you want to be a part of the show's community, you can find us on social media. We're at New Olympian on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. There's also a subreddit, reddit.com slash r slash The New Olympian. And then there's also the Discord that you get access to by joining any tier of the Patreon over at thenewsolympian.com slash Patreon. If you want to get some TNO merch, you can go to thenewsolympian.com slash merch. And if you want to support the show, and as a thank you, get access to a whole bunch of bonus content. You can do that at thenewsolympia.com slash Patreon. Speaking of that Patreon, let's give a shout out to our producer level patrons, Kelsey Gillespie, The Damn Steam Nuggets, Vicky Garcia, Ellie Hauskovchova, Veronica Bartova, Haley Hastings, Robin Garcia, Frida Vickstrom, Megan Moon, Craig McRoberts, Taylor Payne, Giselle Salvador, Peter Johnson, The Twins, Sabrina Balsiger, Boney Pony, Casey Williams, Polly Burge, Nikki Harris, Tatiana Schmidt, Sandra Rose, Josh Sayre, Josh Wilkie, Abby Ryan, Wise Girl, Ashton Gabrielson, Marco Redhouse, Caden Max, Sam Sam Reby, Riley K, 
Kid S. Mary, Kelly, Audra, Mrs. O'Leary, Rodith Kalna, Milo Kim, Harlan Christ, CC Reads 23, Sand Cough, Julia Kendall, Emil Oscar Thomason, Liz Cardigan, Sarah Neal, Ricky, John Drielsma, Rayla Matthews, Riley Draken, Luna Cadoon, Sky Mallory, Elizabeth Obermiller, Aiden Parziani, Biggest Tyson Fan, Hunter Landstrom, Captain Jack Rackham, Sky Captain and the Princess, King Bastion, One Damn Distraction Coming Up, Ethan Robinson, Ginger Spurs Boy, Joshua Aid, A Cup of Solace, Meg Roy, Lux, Neil, Will Buchanan, and Olivia Krenicki. If you want to support the show in a non-monetary way, simply talking about the show is so helpful. Word of mouth is huge. So you can tell someone that you know who loves Percy Jackson about the podcast, or you can talk to someone who's looking for an excuse to finally get into the Percy Jackson books about it, or someone who's maybe getting hyped for the TV show that's coming up and they want to understand what's going on. Or you could post about the show on social media, or you could leave us a rating and review on whatever podcasting app you're using. All these things really do help. I'm very appreciative to everyone who has already done so and to anyone who will do so in the future. But I'm just so thankful that you tuned into this episode, and I hope you tune into our next episode, episode 100, where Sequoia Simone and I, live from Chicago, cover all of chapter 19. And I'm just going to say it's the funniest episode of TNO that exists. Get hype as hell. But until then, I'll proceed you later. Hey everyone, how's it going? It's me, ASMR Make. So here in the Shubio, I've got a cabinet full of various electronics that I use for the show and stuff. And one of the very important ones, oh, I just made a noise with it, is my wireless mouse, which I've used for gaming purposes, playing Hades the video game, which I can now write off as basically like uh, preparing for the podcast. So it's all good. So I was just going to make some noises with that wireless mouse near the microphone. So here's me clicking left and right. Here's me scrolling the scroll wheel. Here's me clicking it. Here's me clicking one of the other buttons. And then there are two buttons on the side because it's like a gaming mouse. So let me click those buttons as well. And then I don't know if this will translate, but I'm going to run the mouse over the windsock of the microphone and maybe it'll make some noise. Thank you for listening.